Okay, this is um, part two of this paper, uh, January 24, Physics International A-Level. It's the AS unit on waves and electricity, so it's unit two for the Edexcel International version of the exam. So we went through questions 1 to 15 in the first video. We're now going to do the second video, which is questions 16 to 18. Okay, so here's question 16 in front of you. It's got a metal rod on top of a church. Yeah, may have uh, been the world's first lightning conductor. So what is a lightning conductor? The metal rod is connected to the ground. So a light lightning conductor is a conductor which allows any electricity to discharge through to the ground. Okay, by a steel cable. So this is a steel cable all the way to the ground. And they basically want you to work out the length of the steel cable and they give you some information. So when the lightning strikes, charge is transferred to the metal rod. Yeah, here's a metal rod all the way from the top. Through the steel cable, it can is connected to the ground. And it's conducted to the ground through the steel cable. Okay, so this, they're now giving us some facts. The steel cable has a diameter of 12 millimeters. That means 12 times 10 to the minus 3 meters which gives us a radius of 6 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. Okay, the steel cable, uh, the total resistance of the cable is given to us as 0.078 ohms. Okay, so that's R. R is this value. And they want you to calculate the, the total length of the cable, L. So we want to find L. They've given us the resistivity of the steel. So as soon as you hear resistivity, you know they want you to use R equals rho L over A. Yeah, where A is pi R squared, yeah, the cross-sectional area of the wire. So basically one mark for working out the area as shown. You can then use the value in here. We want to work out L, so I've changed the subject of the formula to make it L equals RA over rho. Um, the resistance is given to us, the area we calculated, and the resistivity is given to us here. So you just put them all in, you'll get 63.0 meters to three significant fig figures. But you will notice that most of the data given to us is two significant figures. So you should really quote your answer from three and simplify it to two. I have seen examiners take marks off if you put unnecessary numbers of significant figures. That's the first part done. Okay, so that's question 16 done. First part. Second part is talking about during a lightning strike. We've had many of those recently here. Um, the biggest storm in 75 years. So during a lightning strike there was a potential difference PD of 1.5 times 10 to the 8 volts. Okay, so between the metal rod and the ground. Okay, so the PD causes a current of 1.2 times 10 to the 4 amps. That's a large current. Yeah, that's why lightning can kill you. So I uh, in the cable, but it only lasts for a time of microseconds. Okay, so I've had students do this question and they've forgotten what micro means. So remember, that means 70 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. They want you to calculate the work done. Well, work done is voltage times current times time. Okay, so electrical work. Uh, as the charge is conducted, so you're basically doing the electrical work. The voltage is given to us, the current is given to us, and the time duration is given to us. So it will be 126 million joules, or 1.26 times 10, 10 to the 8, using three significant figures. Again, they're giving us two significant figures in a data, so you should simplify it. 1.3 times 10 to the 8 joules, two significant figures. I stress this because you don't want to lose marks for not for putting inappropriate numbers of significant figures. Part C. The steel cable is replaced with the copper cable. Okay, The copper cable has the same length and diameter, so L and A stay the same. During a thunderstorm, the PD between the metal rod and the ground is the same as we've just done. Yeah, So it hasn't changed. So PD is the same Yeah, for both. The dimensions of the physical dimensions of the wires are the same. Okay, so copper has a lower resistivity than steel. Okay, so you could say 
then st the resistivity of copper is less than the resistivity of steel. So I'm always doing this while I'm reading. It's called active reading. I recommend it. With, you'll do it the same way. Okay? There is, that means there's a greater number of conduction electrons per unit volume in copper than in steel. That's N in the equation I equals N A Q V or V Q, whichever way you want to do it. So this is per, meter, per unit volume. So a student uh, states, and they love doing this in these exams, a student states something and you've got to prove or disprove it, that the drift velocities of the electrons will be the same. Well, the drift velocity is a V in this equation. So will VC equal VS is basically what you want to do. As, uh, assess this statement. So basically you're trying to find out, does VC equal VS? Prove it. Okay. Well, since we know that R equals rho L and A, and L and the A are the same for both, we know that the resistance, due to the resistivity mainly, yes, the only thing that changes, is less for the copper than for steel. Okay, so we know that already, and since the PD for both of them are the same, and uh, we know the resistance is less, then we know if the resistance is less, the current must be greater. Okay, for the copper. So we've already proven uh, a couple of points. I don't know if they're on the mark scheme. What question are we on? Sixteen, part C. Okay, so copper has a lower resistance, you'll get one mark. Okay, um, therefore a greater current, two marks for the same PD. Okay, PD is the same, Cur current's uh, bigger. So you have to make the connection between these two, you can't just write uh, co current is greater. Okay, and since I, which we know is greater, is N, Q, V, A, Q and A are the same for both, because Q is the charge uh, of an electron, because the charge carriers are electrons in metal wires. So the Q is an electron for both. A is the same for both. Um, then we know that N is bigger for the copper. Okay, So the current is bigger, N is bigger. So it could just be due to the N. But we want to know, what about the V? What happens to the V? Well, if N goes up, I goes up, because these two don't change. So. So it says, but the difference could be because N is higher for copper. Or it could also be, that, it, that contributes partly to it, but that V for copper may be different. But it's not possible to say, without further information, exactly how much difference there is in N for each. Now, unless we knew exactly how much the current had increased by, yeah, and we knew the exact value for how much N is greater, we cannot determine a conclusion. So the student we cannot assess the student's statement, okay? And that's what they want you to do. This is your conclusion. And that's your three marks. Okay, that's question 16 done. The penultimate question is question 17. It's about diffraction, Huygens construction, and about interference going through the gaps. So you have wave traveling, the harbor wall here, the wave going through two gaps, the gaps are need to be approximately the same size as the wavelength of the waves. So the diagram shows a harbor, yeah, where boats can shelter from the waves. Um, the boats can enter and leave through the two gaps in the harbor wall as shown. Waves in the sea are diffracted as they pass through each uh, through the gaps. Yeah, obviously in the harbor wall. So when I put in brackets, it means it's like uh, obvious information, okay? Describe the Huygens, how Huygens construction can be used to predict the shape of the diffracted wavefront. So basically, why do waves diffract when they come through a gap? Okay, now Huygens said, came up with the idea that every point between here and here acts as a secondary wavefront. So basically, each one produces a tiny little wavelet and they create the waves the next wave going through. So if you keep on doing that, that's why it diffracts through the gap. Okay, that's what Huygens construction is about. If you don't know about it, go and read your course textbook to make sure you have a good set of notes on it, please. Okay, so basically Huygens says each point on a wavefront, and these are wavefronts, okay, positions on the, uh, the, the wave, okay, is treated as a source or as a secondary source better, of smaller waves or wavelets going through each gap. Okay, so that's one mark. 
These wavelets can then interfere or superpose, which is another term for it, I prefer interference, um, which allows you to predict the shape of the diffracted waves. Okay, so if that's happening with both of them, when, the, when they then cross over each other, so it comes here, yeah, and the next one comes over here, where the peaks meet, meet the peaks, then you'll get a constructive interference. Okay, so obviously in the middle, you'll get uh, alignment of the waves coming together in, in phase. Okay, because the peaks will arrive together, the troughs will arrive together, so you have bigger uh, build-up or superposition of waves. Okay, in the middle. At different angles, you may get interference, which is constructive or destructive, which is what they're going on to next. So they're giving you more information. Okay, you need to read through it. The wave fronts in the sea arrive parallel to the harbour wall. You can see they're parallel to the harbour wall. Okay, the wavelength of the, of the waves vary as the weather varies. So depending on the day, the wavelengths could be changed. Uh, there are identical boats at positions A and B. In other words, this is a controlled variable. Okay. Now you'll notice A is right in the middle and B is off closer to one of the gaps than the other. Okay. So remember the one in the middle, the waves that come from here and here will always arrive together in phase. Okay. Because the path difference from here to here and uh, is zero. The path difference between the waves coming through here and the path and the and and the waves coming through here. There is almost there is zero path difference right at the center. So at position A, the, all, the waves oscillate with a large amplitude. Okay, that's constructive interference, in other words. At position B, sometimes oscillates with the boat at position B. In other words, the boat is what we're seeing, the buildup of the waves uh, acting on it. Sometimes oscillate with a large amplitude, and sometimes oscillates with a very small amplitude. In other words, depending on the size of the waves, it will either be constructive or destructive. So this will be destructive. Okay, but it can sometimes be constructive interference as well. So this is basically what this theory is about, and that you can guess what they're going to ask you next. Okay. They're saying explain why the boats oscillate um, as described. Now, six marks. Okay. So surely they should have. Oh, they have. They put this asterisk. Whenever they put an asterisk, it means this quality of your written communication. So the diffracted waves through each gap interfere. So as long as you know there's interference, you get one mark. As A is in the center, as I explained to you before, there is no path difference or phase difference between the waves from each gap. Okay? So this is at the center. Okay? So there will be constructive interference always. The peaks and troughs will arrive together. That's A. Okay? However, at position B, there will be a path difference between the waves arriving from each gap, okay? And the potential phase difference, okay? Between the two waves, okay? So the phase difference, so we want to know what is the phase difference. So this is understanding that B, there will be a path difference between the two gaps. If the path difference is such that the waves arrive out of phase, I think this is the easiest way of putting it, it depending on the wavelength on the day, yes, because remember that varies with the weather, there will be a destructive interference occurring, okay? And this will lead to small oscillations. So if you've got those points all linked up, yeah, destructive interference leads to small oscillations. In other words, mathematically it will be when the path difference is n lambda over 2. In other words, an odd number. It will be uh, n is an integer, so it will be um, an odd number n lambda over 2. I think that's correct. You'll get destructive interference, okay? I'm um, not sure that maths is correct, but that's what I think is written in the exam. An odd number of half wavelengths. Yes, yeah, so it should be an odd number of lambda over 2. I should have written it n lambda over 2. So if you've got n being an odd number. So when n is an odd number, you'll have an odd number of half wavelengths. Then you'll have destructive interference because it'll be out of phase by a half cycle. But however, if the waves from each gap arrive in phase, depending on the weather, when n is an even number, so two, four, six, you're going to have of um, in-phase waves arriving. Um, so it should be n lambda over two, okay, in brackets. Uh, then the, they will interfere uh, constructively, okay, leading to a large oscillation. So that's how you explain what I explained before into the examiner's terms. And if you want to see the examiner's terms, I've padded it out a bit, yeah.
these are the content they're looking for and then depending on the quality of your written communication they'll give you four marks for making four of these points in a clear way and then they give you two marks uh, if your answer shows a coherent and logical structure with good linkages and explanations so your reasoning is clearly demonstrated that you understand what you're, you, you've written about okay it's all about clarity okay so that's uh, question 17 done and now we go to question 18. Question 18 is the resistance of a thermistor. Okay, uh, I apologize for this scribbled out line. I've drawn it to the wrong place. I re was re looking at the wrong scale. So resistance of a particular thermistor varies with temperature as shown. So here's a resistance in ohms and a thermistor in degrees centigrade. So as you can see, as it gets hotter, the resistance drops, which you should know about already, the characteristics of a thermistor. A student connected the thermistor in series with a battery yeah, and a resistor as shown. So here's the resistor. The resistor was made from a long length of wire. Remember, a long length of wire is effectively what a resistor is, depending on uh, the dimensions, okay? Um, okay, so at a temperature of 45 degrees centigrade, so we've got to go to 45 degrees centigrade on the graph, it says the resistance of the thermistor was four times the resistance of the resistor. In other words, they're telling us some algebra. Resistance of the thermistor is four times the resistance of R. So this is RT, resistance of the thermistor, and this is just R. Okay, the length of wire. So I've put it as an algebraic expression. The power, so at this temp, at this value. Okay, so 45 you can read is going to be at this value you can work out what it was. Okay, so You'll need to do that at some stage. But before you do that, that's the next part of the question, by the way. Before you do that, they want you to derive this equation. The power dissipated in the resistor is 0.38 watts. So this in the resistor R, okay? The power dissipated in resistor R was 0.38 watts. So only talking about this part of the circuit. So they want you to derive the equation P equals V squared over R. In other words, they're helping you. Can you work out where this comes from? Well, P equals VI and I equals V over R using Ohm's law. So you can replace I in this equation with V over R, so it becomes V times V over R, which is V squared over R. Basically, they want you to equate this, put it into there, get that, you get your two marks, okay? So that's 18, first part done. Then, using that equation and the graph, determine the potential difference across battery. So as you see on the graph, at 45 degrees, the resistance is 35 ohms, okay? Get the graph back. Double check it. At 45 degrees centigrade, which is halfway between the 50 and the 40, you draw a line up, you go across there, you'll see it's exactly halfway between 30 and 40 ohms. So we know at 45 degrees, which is what we're talking about. So the whole question is at this specific resistance of the thermistor. Okay, so once you've done that, we know that the RT is that, and since they told us that the resistance of the thermistor, thermistor is four times the resistance of R, yes, what can you do? Well, we've got to determine the potential difference across the whole battery. Now, remember, the potential difference across the whole battery, yeah, is the, res is the voltage R across RT plus the voltage across um, R. So the sum of the EMFs, which is what we want, the total EMF is equal to the voltage across RT plus the voltage across R, okay? Once we know one of them, we can work it out because we know the ratio of the resistances, okay? Hope that makes sense. So we know that R is 35 ohms divided by 4. Yeah, so if we know that resistance of thermistor, we know that R from this equation is 35 divided by 4, which gives you the resistance of 8.75 ohms. Now, we know the resistance of 8.75 ohms, and we know the power across that resistor at that temperature was 0.38. Now, there you can see we can use the equation that we just derived because we know the resistance from here, and we know uh, the power here. So the only thing we don't know is the voltage across the R. We know, therefore, we want to make this the subject of the equation. That means V squared will be equal to P times R. Yeah? The power across the resistor and the resistor itself. Multiply the power by the resistance, and you'll get the voltage across the resistor. So if we know that, we know that the voltage across here, if we put a voltmeter in it, will be what we just worked out. So it will be 1.82 uh, 
So here is 1.82 volts, and we know that resistance to the thermistor is four times that value. So we'll know that the voltage across here should be four times that value. Okay? So that means the voltage across the battery will be four times plus one time, it'll be five times the value. Okay? Hope that makes sense. So once we know this, then we know the total resistance circuit is RT plus that, which is five values of this uh, uh, resistance. Yeah, uh, five, five times the voltage, the total resistance will be 5R. And that means the PD across the battery will be five times the value of the PD across the single resistor value. So it's five times the voltage multiplied together, you get 9.1 volts, and that's your final mark. So how you get the marks for this question, yeah, are we talking about 18A part two? They've got two methods lined up for you, yeah. So I did this method, I think, yeah. Worked out this, worked out that it was 1.82 and then multiply by five, because remember, the thermistor is gonna get four times this value and the total voltage was voltage of the cell or the battery, yeah, is equal to the voltage of the thermistor plus the voltage across the resistor. And that's how you did it, okay. So that's question 18, uh, B part two, uh, A part two, sorry, this is A part two. And now we want to do B part one, explain why the resistance of the thermistor decreases as the temperature increases. Well, it's basically because of this equation, okay? Well, increased temperature causes the number of conduction electrons, obviously it's per unit volume, yeah? N to increase. So if N increases, basically, um, the thermistor is, is, an, is a uh, semiconductor device, so when you increase temperature, it's negative temperature coefficient, you actually get more current through. Okay, its resistance decreases unlike, unlike a lattice structure vibrations for a metal. Okay, so if you do that, N goes up, A hasn't changed, Q hasn't changed, and V may or may not change, but you will get a bigger uh, current. Okay, it's not going to decrease V, is it? Okay, one mark for the first point, one mark for the second. And then part three, part two, B part two. So the student then increased the temperature of both the wire resistor and the thermistor from 80 to 90. Well, if you, t if you increase the temperature of the thermistor, its resistance will go down, yeah? Um, so the resistance of the thermistor will go down, but the resistance of the wire will go up. Because I just explained, the wire increases as positive temperature coefficient, coefficient uh, device, and the thermistor is a negative temperature coefficient device. Okay, so one goes up and one goes down with temperature. Explain why the current in the circuit decreased. Okay, so the current in the circuit decreased. We have to explain why. Okay, so we know the current has decreased. So if we know the current has decreased, we know the total resistance must have increased. Okay, that means whatever this one has gone up, this one's gone down. The one that goes up is having a bigger effect than the one that goes down. Okay, so how do you put that in words? Increased temperature increases the lattice vibrations in both. Okay, which increases the collisions between the conduction electrons and the lattice atoms in both. So this happens in both. Okay, it's not that it, it only happens in metals, it happens in both. This causes the resistance of the wire, uh, the resistance of the wire resistor to increase. Yeah. And if, as, yes, if I put, as, I should have put, as the current, so we change that to, as the current in the circuit decreased as stated up there, it means the total resistance must have increased, yeah? So, therefore, we must conclude that the increase in the wire's resistance, or in the wire resistance, must be greater than the decrease in the thermistor's resistance because the total resistance is the two added together. So that's how you break things down into a logical sequence and that's where you get the five marks for each of those dotted points is a marking point, okay? Hope that helps. Yeah, so we have finished question 18. Last is a solar cell. Okay, so solar cells are also made from semiconductor materials like thermistors. One type of solar cell has two layers of semiconducting material, layers one and two, here as shown. 
Layer one on top, layer two on, underneath. Photons of light, photons of light are incident, shining down on the layers. Some of them get absorbed by the first layer and some go through. The minimum energy to release an electron, yes, we call those photoelectrons, from a semiconductor layer is the work function. So the amount, the minimum energy is called the work function. Okay? We know that from uh, what we studied before, okay? uh, the photoelectric effect. So the work function for layer one is given as 1.86 electron volts. Remember from before we said one electron volt is basically this amount of joules. Okay? So this is uh, phi for layer one. So this is the symbol for work function. Okay? So we calculate the minimum frequency of light needed to release an electron. Well, to release an electron, say if it just gets just enough to get to the surface, the minimum will be that it gets to just zero, jumps out and then falls back. So it almost has not enough, it doesn't have any energy to escape, but it's got to the surface and it's, that will be the minimum. So you actually need it to be slightly more than the minimum to make it escape with more than zero kinetic energy. So in other words, the minimum would be the frequency times the times uh, Planck's constant must equal phi. Okay. Um, all right, so this is the threshold frequency. So it would, have, it would have been better to put here the threshold frequency. So you actually need the frequency to be slightly higher so you can actually escape. Okay, so H of F min will be equal to the energy of the work function, which is 1.686 electron volts, which is you multiply it by what one electron voltage, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So you multiply that, you get 2.98 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So the F minimum, it once you once you know the, the value, you want to work out the F minimum, you've got to divide it by H. So you divide both sides by H. That's H given to you in a data sheet, and you'll get the value of the frequency, the threshold frequency, which is what they should have called it, but they called it the minimum frequency, which to three significant figures, it's correct. But remember, that we, our values are known to two significant figures, um, uh, and here three. So you can do two or three, yeah, in this case. So it's approximately 4.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So when you when you quote it and you want to put two significant figures, that's fine, because we know only this to two significant figures. Uh, but when you're calculating, make sure you kept a record of the accurate value for future calculations. So that's question 19, the beginning. Then it says, and I'll say this is the trickiest question in the, in the exam. Light from the sun is instant on the solar cell. The instant the intensity of the instant light is constant. So basically that means the number of photons arriving per second is constant. That's what intensity of photons is, is how many are arriving per second. Okay. Uh, layer one has a greater work function than layer two. Yeah. In other words, layer two has a lower threshold frequency. So it will give off electrons more easily than layer one. So photons, and it tells you here, photons not absorbed by layer one are transmitted through to layer two. So it goes through, as it was shown in the diagrams in the, at the beginning, some of the photons go through layer one and get to la layer two, okay? All right, so layer one is then removed from the solar cell so that all the photons now reach layer two. In other words, don't have layer one. So this is the second scenario. So we've got up to here, first part of the question. Second one, what happens when you remove it? Okay, so remember layer two has a lower work function, yeah, than layer than layer one. Okay, so if they manage to give off electrons in layer one, they will also um, emit electrons in layer two, uh, those frequencies. Explain how removing layer one affects the rate at which electrons are released in the solar cell. Okay, so um, I, th I think that's a mistake. Let's ignore that for now. Okay, so we talked about that. All right, you should assume that each layer absorbs all photons with a frequency greater than the minimum frequency for that layer. Okay, so the layer one initially, yeah, will absorb all the ones with the frequency greater than the, the minimum frequency that you worked out before. Okay. If they're lower than that, they won't be absorbed, okay? Which I don't know whether is true or not, but they're telling us to assume that, so we have to assume what they tell us, okay? The number of photons arriving per second is constant. We know that from before. You get a mark for that, for noticing that, okay? So basically you're talking about changing this language into this language, okay? 
Initially, layer one only absorbs the photon with frequency greater than its minimum frequency that we worked out before. Um, in the in those with a greater frequency. So it absorbs those with a greater frequency in effect. Okay, That's another way of saying what I've said. So once that happens, any photons reaching layer two have an energy or a frequency uh, greater than layer two's threshold frequency. So I'm not sure they've got this wording right because I think when they've gone through, they mean any photons uh, reaching a layer two and having an impact, basically being absorbed by it. So I think they talk about reaching it, and I would talk about whether that should be absorbed. Okay? Make sense? So it should really be absorbed, because if it's not absorbed, it could be that the frequent they're going through, but they're not being absorbed. Okay? So if you remove layer one, layer two will still absorb the same number of photons before, because anything that layer one could absorb, yeah, higher frequencies, layer two will also absorb, because it has a lower threshold frequency. Okay, so it will, it will always absorb um, frequencies greater than the minimum frequency of the layer. Okay, so it will be able to do the job of layer one as well. So it'll absorb those previously absorbed by layer one is what I've said, and those previously abs only absorbed by layer two. So basically it's going to do the job of both. Okay, and remember, since the intensity is constant, you have one photon interacting with one electron. So you've still got the same number of photons coming in per second, and therefore, it doesn't matter whether they interact with layer one or layer two, you're basically going to have the same number of interactions. Okay? So the rate at which electrons are released remains the same. Okay? So it's the, this is the starting point. So this is, we're going back to that point. And that's how you get the one, two, three, four, five points in this exam. Okay? In this paper. Okay? I hope that makes sense. Finally, we now have a bit of mathematics to do. So they're changing the solar cell into the effectively two cells in series, yeah, as in voltage providers. So they both have an EMF, okay? So two cells in series with a, a 4.0 ohm resistor externally. So these two are um, in series with an external resistor, okay? The student adjusted the light conditions that's the light coming in, is represented by the arrows, as you should know, so that each solar cell had an EMF of 5 volts. Each one had an EMF of 5.0 volts, two significant figures, and an internal resistance R of 0 0.80 ohms. So each one of these has an internal resistance. The power dissipated in the resistor was 13 watts here, okay, under the, with the circuit diagram is shown. But the student then suggested that connecting the cells in parallel would cause the power dissipated here to be less than half of 13. So in other words, less than 6.5 watts. Now, you've got to deduce whether the student's suggestion is correct. So will it be less than 6.5 watts? Well, if the two cells are in parallel, so will be their internal resistances, yeah? So their internal resistance, so the total internal resistance would halve, because obviously if you know, one over RT is one over R1 plus one over R2. So basically this is the resistors in parallel. So you basically have got two resistors in parallel, okay? Um, that you know that the, you're gonna add those fractions up and then inverse it. So the total resistance will be 0.4 if you do the, the algebra, okay? So now you've got a total resistance in the circuit externally of 4 ohms and the two, basically count the two cells that you've put in parallel. So imagine you've got these two cells in parallel as basically one power unit. So still, imagine you can't see what's inside them. You've got one power unit. So this is your closed box and it's now going with an external resistance. Okay, that's what you've got. So this is your power unit. Okay, you don't have to worry about this. It's still going to have, each of those is 5 volts, so it's still going to have 5.0 volts, but this time the internal resistance is going to be 0 0.40 ohms. Okay, so the externally that hasn't changed. So now, but the total resistance of the circuit is, that our total for the circuit is 4.4 .4 ohms. Okay, so once you know that, you can work out from Ohm's law, the current is the 5 volts EMF, 
divided by the total resistance, which is 4.4 ohms, which is 1.14 amps. Once you know that, um, that you know, so this is the current going in, you know the external voltage is 4.5 uh, 5 volts of it. So basically you're going to lose some of that 5 volts internally. And of course that's going to be the ratio of 4.0 out of 4.4. So that is a potential divider. Okay, so this is basically a potential divider calculation. So basically the 4 volts, the 4 ohms resistor gets 4 out of 4.4 total resistance of the EMF. So this is the external voltage is the EMF times the ratio of the resistances. So you're going to have 4.5 volts um, coming outside after you remove the loss volts inside the cell. Okay, so why do we need that? Because once you know the total external uh, value, because we want to know the power that's dissipated in the external resistor, yeah? The power is the external voltage times the current in the circuit multiplied together, you get 5.19 watts, which is less than 6.5 watts, okay? So he said it should be less than half the value of 13, so it's less than half of 13, so the suggestion is correct. And that's how you get the five marks, is by doing all those phases. And I probably should show you what they've done. Here is 19 part C at the end of the question. So that is the end of the 80 mark exam. If you found that useful, um, please like, share uh, with your friends if they're doing the same exam. And if you're my students, make sure you use this to make improvements to your scripts the next time uh, you have a chance. Okay, so that's the end of the paper. Please subscribe also so you know when uh, future videos are coming in. I think the next one, for those of you doing Unit 1 retake, I'll, I have done some answers for the Unit 4, uh, for the Unit 1 paper that was done in January. Okay, so if you need to revise, that will be a good thing for you to go and do before the exam in May. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully see you in the next video. Bye for now.